one with these beautiful lights here, yeah. but that's all right. Um, before we begin, we just want to uh, say a quick thank you to the organization, Benjamin in particular, for inviting us to be here. This is, uh, for us academics, a unique opportunity to present at a festival like this. And we want to offer our thanks to the band Fluisteraars for allowing us to translate our latest album uh, into the title of our research, Gripped by the Soul of Spiritual Awakening. Christopher. Yes, hello. Good morning, or good afternoon, I should say. Yes, uh, I am Christopher Thompson. I am a postdoctoral researcher at Malmö University and a guest researcher at Erasmus University, University of Rotterdam. And this is uh, DJ PDA. <laughs> and yeah, the title of our presentation today is Gripped by the Soul of Spiritual Awakening, Heritage and Identity in Black Metal Across Norway in the Dutch-speaking Low Countries. Next slide, please. You can just step it a few times so everything appears in view. So yeah, uh, I think a, a, a good question to start with is what are we actually doing here? Why are we as researchers actually at an extreme metal festival? Uh, well, first of all, black metal from the low countries is severely under-researched, especially uh, at a more advanced level. You see things with uh, at a bachelor's and master's, but nothing done, you know, that's peer-reviewed. Um, we also understand the importance of research from the inside, uh, that being a shared ethnographical approach. Uh, this means working together with artists, uh, venues, bookers, fans, you know, to get a better picture of what black metal is about and what it does in this part of the world. But also, and importantly, uh, we want to avoid prejudices and preconceived notions about what black metal is in regards uh, to politics and genre. We want to work collaborative, collaboratively and not uh, antagonistically um, to be able to answer our questions, basically. Um, and uh, at the same time, we want to stress outreach and engagement with the public. So where better to do this than a metal festival? Uh, so what is the impetus for this research? What brings us, what really brings us here today? Well, both of us have previously studied and published on uh, about black metal, or metal music in particular. Uh, I have researched and written a dissertation on Ouija black metal. DJ has written about um, indigenous metal from Arctoa and uh, New Zealand. And uh, in equal part, we have both maintained academic and per uh, personal interest in extreme metal. And to us, extreme metal is not just a music genre. It connects to larger issues about history, heritage, and local, regional, and national identities. For instance, a band from Limburg is not the same from a, uh, as a band from Belgium. Uh, so here's really the crux. There are significant gaps in the research about metal music from the low countries uh, and how it connects to heritage and history. And well, basically, it needs more nuance. You know, this is not some Sabaton history channel on, uh, on YouTube. This is a little bit more in depth. And so then it brings us to our research question. Uh, you can kind of see it. So how do divergent uses of black metal aesthetics and cultural narratives differ between the region uh, and Dutch-speaking low countries? I can't see the rest of it, but anyway, <laughs> how do these have different meanings and outcomes, basically? Go on to the next slide. So yeah, uh, probably a really important place to start is just to ask the basic question, what is black metal? Uh, how do we understand it? Uh, there's something of an ongoing and perpetual debate about what black metal is and how it, one can define it. Uh, early in uh, the Norwegian black metal, or Norwegian and Swedish scenes, prominent bands and musicians st believe strongly that black metal should be defined ideologically or as a worldview. For some, that means black, more, black metal is more of a mentality. Uh, if you take, for instance, um, or to take a quote from Vinsvall from Lutas Nord, black metal is a feeling, not a typical kind of riff, sound, or attitude, and this feeling is the essence of our music. If you can understand this point of view, Lutas Nord will be a black metal band. If not, it's not our problem. Um, others, like uh, Ashton Oseth from, or better known as Aronimus from Mayhem, claim that lyrics, or the lyrics, must be satanic and, uh, for the music to be considered black metal. And this is quite narrow, of course, yet. If you consider that black metal in the late 1980s, early 1990s was reacting uh, against these commercialized, more more commercialized styles of metal, then we can understand perhaps this oppositional stance. Um, in more general terms, uh, black metal has an open meaning setting. We're going to get the more academic uh, definition of what, I, what I'm talking about here. 
an open meeting setting that allows for potentially broad definitions of what can and cannot be, uh, something that allows a lot of experimentation in black metal. However, uh, black metal has rather restrictive boundaries, especially aesthetically, and these boundaries are strongly policed. Um, and it is this sort of reasoning that is often used when trying to defend bands that have connections to far-right politics. Um, anyways, black metal's pursuit of, ex of the extreme and non-normative that have ironically made it an attractive artistic space for right-wing reactionaries and radical conservatives. I think we all can, uh, can identify one particular scene that has those sort of tendencies and this VM particular. But uh, for DJ and I, um, we define black metal musically, and we think that it will give us more of an objective uh, criteria when trying to analyze bands, uh, especially when we move forward in the project. At the same time, we both understand that this still requires some subjectivity, like it's still interpretive to at least on some level. So, getting in tune to the sound of black metal, what, what does it sound like? At least according to us, um, black metal sound includes uh, mid to high pitched screaming vocals, a guitar playing aesthetic and technique that tends to use full chord voicings and produce a denser and less clearly resonant timbre when played through heavy distortion, uh, as opposed to uh, you know, root and fifth pace power chords that are pretty well, I'm sure you guys have all heard of those. Um, uh, guitars tend to be EQ to uh, mid to high with low to tile down. This is typical. This is you know broad strokes. This is obviously uh, there are there, uh, not everything applies to that. Uh, and then this is also combined with blasting drum techniques and combined with a tempo that moves hypermetrically. You know, if we look for examples, there you can listen to Gorder off the birth zone, Margaret 1349, as well as uh, and oddly enough, uh, Chopin Scherzo number one has these sort of sounds. But that's just the metal part. What about the history identity context of our research? Can we go on to the next slide. So for research purpose here, Norway and Norwegian black metal are the key reference points. Norway is chosen for a couple of reasons. First, Norwegian black metal was the first significant and commercially viable black metal scene to develop after an initial wave of bands in the early and mid 1980s. As a result, Norwegian black metal has had arguably the biggest impact on the direction of black metal sound and form. Um, second, Norwegian black metal uh, has and continues to be the subject of a lot of academic research and is likely the most studied form of metal music in academia. And it's for these reasons, Norwegian black metal is the perfect reference point and comparison point uh, when approaching other black metal scenes and local bands, both musically prolific with you know, 700 plus bands and then you know, it's a substantial amount of previous research. And, public interest. As this festival shows. Yes, as this festival shows, exactly. So moving on to a bit more of the historical context, we're going to start with Norway and, and kind of how it 19th century frames a lot of what we see. Uh, so this is by no means exhaustive, but just a, a brief historical uh, and contextual overview during the 19th century to frame our kind of initial hypothesis. So Norwegian black metal's visual and lyrical content is heavily rooted in Norway's national awakening in the 19th century, especially from the 1840s onward. Uh, throughout this time, Norway, Norway underwent a rather intense awakening of Norwegian culture, the making of Norwegian culture, that is, become culturally distinct, distinct from both Denmark and Sweden. You had, uh, for example, genuine experts who went into the Norwegian countryside and recorded all aspects of Norwegian peasant life. Foremost among those being local music, uh, folk tales, and dialects. Uh, Norwegian history was basically rewritten or reconceived to emphasize Norwegian independence uh, in the period before 400 years of Danish rule, drawing a direct line from the Viking kings to that specific time. Uh, furthermore, there was also the invention of a discrete Norwegian language, Ni uh, which is an amalgamation of Western Norwegian dialects. Norwegian nature uh, it was also a huge inspiration for uh, many artists and writers. Um, and there was an eagerness there to link Norway's primordial nature and primordial landscapes with the Norwegian people, give to some sort of essence to the, to the Norwegian people through the nature. And then uh, finally, Norwegians who had a room to develop this cultural identity despite being part of Nor or Sweden at the time, but the, um, as they had a political, more of a political independence uh, despite their, despite their uh, conjunction with, <laughs> with Sweden. Um, but the general idea of these, of these expressions were kind of all the same. Norway and Norwegians are unique and, and uh, independent. 
And you can't uh, compare two different or various different scenes without also being able to compare the historical context. And that is why you also need to know the historical context in which uh, the Netherlands and Belgium and Flanders specifically in the context of our research came in national awakening. And in the Netherlands specifically, um, from the 1870 onwards this happened when uh, specifically Catholic governmental parties started to become aware of the decline of their national patrimony. Think for example the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam today at the time was really a building almost in ruins and it became restored as a site of national glory to expose the glory of the Netherlands at the time. And this took off into education, into the arts. Uh, for example, authors like Vondel, Hooft, painters like Rembrandt, Hals, Vermeer at the time were kind of rediscovered, so to speak, and they were tied to this glorious national past, such as the war of resistance against the Spanish rulers, as well as uh, what we now call the, the Golden Age of the Netherlands. And it's interesting that while there was this increase of a national narrative in the Netherlands, many of these authors and painters at the time were not really tied to a notion of the Netherlands, but more their local cities. Rembrandt is really first in Amsterdam, Hals is forever tied to uh, Haarlem, Vermeer is forever tied to Delft, for example. So it's interesting that in recent years, due to decentralizing liberal governments, a lot of these provinces and cities have regained a lot of political power as well as social, cultural and economic responsibilities. And that led to a kind of a decrease in national unity, with one exception, that being sports. Uh, I think we can all remember uh, the orange wave when football occurs or Formula One takes over the country. But you also need to know uh, the national awakening context for Belgium. And when we're talking about the Dutch-speaking low countries, we're not talking about Belgium, uh, we're more talking about Flanders in particular. And Flanders, uh, of course, became part of Belgium in the 1830s. And at the time, and still to this day, Belgium is comprised of several lingual groups, uh, French, Dutch, uh, German, uh, Brussels being kind of amalgamation in the middle. But at the time of the unification of Belgium in the 1830s, uh, the French groups really dominated the country's political, cultural, economic, religious life. And from the mid-19th century onward, this led to a rise in a cultural movement that started to note and, and address the lack of Flemish cultural expression in cultural life, theater, literature, and education. The most famous example we took a picture of here, that being the Battle of the Golden Spurs, the Golden Spurs, which was forever kind of legendarized uh, in uh, Hendrik Conscience's book, The Lion of Flanders. Um, and this kind of tension between Dutch and French-speaking parts of Belgium came to a head in World War I with this imbalance of power between, on the one hand, French uh, officers and often Flemish foot folk. And after the First World War, the commemoration of Flemish soldiers and, in its extent, Flemish nationality became very organized political and cultural movement. For anyone who has ever been to Ypres or Dixmude, this will sound familiar if you remember the monuments in that area. And this came to another head, of course, in World War II, and from the 1990s on, the Flemish national identity in, became a real political movement with parties like Flaams Bloc, Flaams Belang, and VA, um, who really started to focus on this uh, discourse of a uh, Flemish independence and national pride. Uh, drawing on the kind of the same stories as uh, Henry Conscience already did this uh, uh, legendarization of a, a historious, glorious Flemish past. And there's an interesting crux there, because if we look at historical Flanders, this is a historical reality with the duchies of Flanders. However, historical Flanders is not the same as current day Flanders. For example, we are now in Limburg, but that was not historically a part of Flanders. It was part of the Liege diocese, the Lux Bisdom. And so there is this distinction between the historical and the legendary national identity Flanders uh, that is not to be missed here. So what is the main takeaway for that context that we're talking about? So despite that we're talking in different timelines between Norway, the Netherlands and Flanders, the trajectories of this national identity awakening that highlight local life, traditions, cultural expressions and languages um, all run along similar lines, and these are not accidental lines. These are often very uh, organized, very conscious, cultural uh, elite movements. However, they do ultimately come out with different results. And now the interesting question is, how do these results translate into low countries black metal, especially given the aesthetic history of the aesthetic influence of Norwegian black metal? Next slide, please. 
Um, you can press it a few times so that our hypotheses come into view. Of course, we are academics, so we have a research question, and we also need to have a few questions on which we can mirror our results. So we have three hypotheses uh, that build into these uh, cultural and political contexts. So first of all, of course, we expect some very clean, di clear differences uh, to Norwegian black metal, a scene that is very nationally bound and where these local and regional identities connect to a larger uh, national narrative. We don't expect to find the same thing in Netherlands and the, Fla the Netherlands and Flanders. As a similarity, we do expect that uh, local heritage identities are explicitly expressed in Low Countries black metal. But that in the Netherlands, we expect these expressions to be a bit more abstract. Um, and in Flanders, we do expect more clear references to local identity and heritage, be it from Western Flanders, Eastern Flanders, Antwerp, Flemish Brabant, Limburg, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So now, of course, comes the very interesting question. Which bands did we interview at this point? We have already sat down with bands like Freya, Kulle, and uh, Rituals uh, of the Dead Hand. And since I'm talking to a very expert audience here today, I don't think that I need to introduce these bands to a great degree. But for anyone who is interested in uh, what they sound like, who they are, uh, we cautiously recommend the use of Encyclopedia Metalum. Now, um, what did we find in these interviews? Um, I want to point to very two uh, distinct cases uh, with the interviews from Klude and from Rituals of the Dead Hand. For those who don't know, Klude is a band from Aalst, a, country, a, a city, country, a city with a very vivid, very dark, very bloody past at points. And Klude, in keeping with black metal's uh, transgressive nature, uh, the kind of shock elements that are part and parcel of the genre. Uh, they really use the, the negative identity or the negative image that people have in Flanders of Aalst. Anyone here who knows the name Martin Aalst can raise their hand or have, has ever heard it. There we go. Um, they use that kind of shock effect value and tie it to being from Aalst saying, we are from Aalst, that is an extreme city, we make an extreme kind of music and they draw on a lot of local legends and folklore for that, some very recent, some very historical. And then you have the band uh, Rituals from the Dead Hand, who are very close to here, uh, who draw on the historical versus folkloric buck rider mythology um, that people may know from literature, from music, or the Efteling maybe. Um, now, in our conversation, what came forward is that there is this distinction between, on the one hand, uh, a, a large uh, condemnation of a large group of people that weren't actually buck riders, that were kind of swept in the flood, and the folkloric buck riders that were either Robin Hoods or that were uh, scound scandalous villains and uh, uh, very bad people altogether that shook hands with the devil. And again, in keeping with Black Metal's extremity, leg uh, legacy of extremity, uh, Rituals of the Dead Hand, of course, blamed that very extreme image of uh, the folkloric buck riders as a very local legend. But um, we can talk on and on about these very specific findings in the uh, interviews, but we are, of course, very interested also in what the kind of general red threads throughout the interviews were and how those answer our research question, namely, how do these black metal bands from the Dutch-speaking low countries balance on the one hand this musical and ideological heritage, and on the other hand, this very national identity heritage. And we found a few things already, so with some caution, we have a few conclusions already, or a few early findings, rather. And that is that, for one, in the Dutch-speaking Low Countries, black metal does little, have little to no connection to a national heritage. Uh, music and symbols and folklore are mostly used for personal experiences and connections, or uh, for drawing on localized narratives and identities. And we see this distinction between, in the Netherlands on the one hand, this very abstract sense of locality, personal interpretations and meanings sought behind symbols and stories, versus in Flanders, uh, drawing on local uh, and regional heritage that's put to direct use, not to say we are from Belgium, but to say we are from Diepenbeek or we are from Aalst. So, yeah, taken together, the Low Countries black metal is, as you can expect, astoundingly different from uh, black metal from Norway. Um, and this gives bands the opportunity to be very progressive musically and conceptually, uh, and to break with an often prejudiced, uh, prejudiced, 
preconceived notion that black metal would always be conservative, it needs to always sound like Emperor or Burzum or 1349, or uh, that black metal is always reactionary and right-wing and that these bands are actually everything but that. These are some very early findings in our research already. Next slide, please. So then, what is next for us? Well, first of all, what we're doing right now is transcribing and completing uh, the analysis of these interviews. And what we're doing there is working closely together with the bands. These bands always have the opportunity to comment on the transcription. They can add uh, or they can clarify some parts that they stated in the interviews. Uh, and we also share our analyses with them so that we work towards this notion of shared authority. We are not experts on black metal. We have our own history with the genre. We have our own views on what the genre can and cannot or should and should not be. And we think that the bands who are much more experts in that field than we are have a say in that matter and we want to work cooperatively, cooperatively with them. And that also helps us towards more interviews in the future with bands, some of whom are going to be here today. Um, keep up with our research and you'll know who they are. Um, because we need to diversify the outcomes, of course. Not all Dutch bands will draw on an abstracted sense of locality. Not all Flemish bands will draw on local legends and folklore. But we don't know that until we actually find the bands that prove that and interview them to talk about it with them. Um, and to achieve that, to work together with bands in the future, we need to draw on word of mouth. We need to build a relationship of trust. So being here today, giving, being given the opportunity to speak to audiences, to fans, and to band members, hopefully, uh, we can show that we are not out to get anyone. We're not here to point uh, and say fingers and say, your kind of music is bad, your kind of music is good, and we only want to hear the second one. No, we want to build as diverse an image of uh, Dutch as uh, Dutch speaking low countries black metal as possible and for that we need to build a relationship of trust so this is a kind of good practice that we want to continue to promote as we go forwards. Um, now where can you find this research in the future? We already had one presentation in Oxford for an academic uh, audience that was very well received. There is of course this opportunity here for which again we are very thankful and then in late 2023, early 2024 we hope to publish this uh, an article at least uh, for which we are also going to release a shirt and the earnings of which we will use to make that article as freely accessible as possible because unfortunately that continues to be an issue in academic publication. So that being said, we can move to the final slide. Um, I can say now something that I've been hoping to say ever since I started listening to Metal as a Kid, which is thank you for coming to our show. <laughs> Um, we want to thank again you, everyone, for being here. This is definitely the largest crowds we, uh, crowd we as academics have ever had. Um, we want to thank Benjamin and the organization, the technical crew. Um, there is, let me quickly see, yeah, no time left for questions, but for those of uh, you who are interested to know more, you can find us outside. We'll have a drink together, share a beer, talk about black metal, talk about the future of this research. And um, yeah, that being said, Thank you all very much, rock on, and enjoy the rest of the festival. Thank you.